Good afternoon, Louie, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this STEM talk. We're really excited to hear about your career path and how it brought you to your current role and to introduce marine bio biology to our young adults. Now, Celine Gordon is going to discuss some few questions that she has for you. Hi, Louie. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you. And thanks, Sam, for the introduction. So um, we're curious initially to find out a little bit about what your role is. I know you're at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, otherwise known as MBL. And curious about what you do there and actually your career path in general, how you got into the position that you're in today. All right, well, thank you for having me today. And uh, let's see if I can give you some answers to that. Uh, I am currently Director of Imaging Services. So uh, in the course of researchers doing their work here and lots of other places, uh, they use microscopes. So we need um, to provide those microscopes and expertise in how to use them. And you probably all remember from high school where you know, it was a pretty simple light microscope and or a dissecting microscope. So we do have those, we start with those, but we get up to pretty advanced light microscopy techniques and into advanced techniques called fluorescent imaging, which you can label proteins. Um, there's a, the new advent is GFP using uh, labeled proteins to fluorescently illuminate particular proteins within a sample. So we use microscopes that'll do that. We have ones that will uh, optically 3D section through a sample so you don't have to physically section it. And then we also have electron microscopes. Um, so we cover kind of the whole gamut of possibilities. And then individuals also have some of those in their own labs. Uh, and we uh, thirdly offer several courses which are generally advanced research techniques for graduate, postgraduate, and even um, you know, principal investigator level courses. And most of those also uh, utilize microscopes. So how did you get involved? Is that was your, and part of my ignorance, but was your career path in microscopic microscopy or did you, um, how did you get to where you, you are now? Sure. Well, as a lot of people, it's a winding path. Uh, so it wasn't a direct line, which may be frustrating at times, but also exciting because there's something around the corner. Uh, I grew up outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so not near the ocean, but I grew up next to a river. Uh, so I guess that was my first introduction to sort of the aquatic world. Uh, my family liked to vacation at the ocean, mostly in New Jersey. Uh, also, it was the time of Jacques Cousteau and, you know, uh, the scuba diver show, I forget who that was. Um, so certainly I was intrigued by that. I was, I loved the out of doors, uh, hunted and fished and hiked and all that sort of stuff. So the natural world really intrigued me. I went to Penn State, which also is a landlocked school, but ironically has a really great marine science program. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of my interest, I took those classes as well as the regular biology sort of curriculum. Okay. So I did graduate with basically a marine science certificate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew about Woods Hole. And so when I graduated, I had the opportunity to come up this way. And I said, I got to take that and see what happens. Uh, so I got up here. I didn't uh, get a job initially in Woods Hole. I got some jobs in Falmouth, uh, but I kept kept after it, tried to get my foot in the door somewhere. And so finally, the uh, National Marine Fisheries offered me a position, which is a temporary position. And I took that, which I thoroughly enjoyed, went to sea quite a bit. Uh, the sort of layman's explanation is we were trying to count how many fish are out there. Um, <laughs> Which, did you come up with a number? Uh, <laughs> yeah, somebody did. I didn't <laughs> myself, <laughs> but I added something to that. Um, and then I heard about this job at the Marine Biological Laboratory, which was not my current position exactly, 
but it was involved in the microscopy facility. And so I uh, applied, I was uh, offered the position and I took it. So again, that's that weaving path. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've now been here for 40 years, which wow. yes, I that's say fantastic. the same thing, surprised <laughs> me. Uh, but what I find exciting about being at the MBL specifically and about my career is that I feel like it's been many, many jobs over those 40 years. So it's certainly not the same job as when I started. It's not the same people, not the same techniques have changed. Uh, although there's some continuity there, certainly, but it, you know, rather than me moving around to lots of different jobs, kind of my job moved around within the institution. Uh, the other great thing about MBL is that we have an incredible um, group of scientists that are here year round. And then we also get a lot of visiting scientists that come primarily in the summer to either do research or to teach and then also students. So there's about, over the course of a season, there's about 1,500 people that come in from around the world. Mm. Uh, many of them very top scientists. In fact, right before I came online with you, I was meeting with the librarian because we have some samples from Osama Shimomura, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering green fluorescent protein. Mm. And we actually just received uh, from his widow some samples of those original GFP constructs. How cool so, is that? Wow. Know, it's just amazing. I know. What does that feel like when you, I mean, because growing up on the Cape, it's interesting because everyone thinks that the Cape is a summer hotspot, which it is, right? Hospitality. But there's so much STEM. Um, there's so much technology. There's, there's so many other things available, especially now on the Cape that people don't know about. Obviously, Woods Hole is now known as this hub right, of all of this great research. And have you seen that evolution and that change in the 40 years that you've been there? Um, or are we just becoming more knowledgeable about it now? Uh, I would say a little bit of both, or actually a lot of both those things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, the MBL has been here since 1888. So there weren't a lot of other scientific things going on probably on the Cape. But, you know, certainly even salt works were here in mm -hmm. you know, those times. And so people were using scientific methods as well as, I'll say, farming sort of methods to do those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly with the uh, introduction of MBL and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and mm -hmm. National Marine Fisheries and stuff like that, okay. you know, there's a lot of spin-off activities that have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and also with the medical field, you know, having two great hospitals in the area, you know, there's right. a lot of medical sort of STEM type things that have happened. Right. Uh, but as actually somewhat as an aside, I was just reading an article about the person that ex discovered echolocation in bats, actually did a lot of his work in Mashpee, which I mm. never knew that. And wow. Yeah. So, you know, so I think the Cape, for whatever reason, has had you know, some pretty good input for STEM uh, activities and right. continues to. And for me, that's, I think I'm in the best of both worlds in the sense of having that exciting STEM opportunities here. But as you mentioned, right. Celine, that it's a great area just to live in. You know, we have right. the ocean and right. all the right. natural world around us. Right. Well, and, and, you know, as we talk about growing a future workforce on the Cape, you know, it's interesting, you, you, part of it is wanting to educate people about the different career paths and those sector prior, those priority sectors, because there is so much more that you see when you live here than the things you notice when you're, you know, visiting or you're a tourist. And, um, you know, it's wonderful that there's, there are career pathways and you're such a perfect example of that, of the ability to raise a family, and you know, really have an entire career here. Um, yeah. I think is, is is fascinating, and I think we need to, you know, tell as many people as we can about that. Sure. Yeah, I agree. And I also, you know, it falls on the people, us, mm -hmm. uh, to really, you know, dig into the weeds and find out what is in there, is available around here. So right. you know, people have to have their eyes open, uh, search out opportunities. I think one of the good things out of this pandemic is 
a lot of like our talks are going online, available mm -hmm. by Zoom and other mm -hmm. uh, avenues. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for people to learn about these sort of hidden gems mm -hmm. uh, that may not have existed before, or even just using the web, you know, to do searches and stuff. Right. So access is more available, right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of the keeper of the keys a little bit, maybe when it comes to the microscopes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that some of them are very expensive and, yes. and sort of coveted. Um, do you have a favorite or, or a piece of equipment that, um, you know, is, is very either specific or unique or um, valuable to MBL? Yeah, well, hopefully they're all valuable Follow to it. us. Right, um, right. But uh, I would say it's sort of a tie between our scanning electron microscope uh, because it just creates beautiful images that are actually pretty easy to generate. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, we call it a confocal microscope, which is a light microscope that uses these fluorescent techniques that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to be able to visualize the internal workings of a cell to me are just incredible and to see it in live cell mm -hmm. uh, is really incredible. What would the researchers that are using, what would they then use that information for? Is it medical research or is it, is it specific to, um, you know, the health of our oceans? What would then that be used for? Well, that's also, I think, why I really enjoy working here because it's very broad uh, and also, for the most part, pretty basic science. Uh, so we're building kind of the backbone of understanding basic processes, whether it's in um, mammalian systems or invertebrates, but also in the aquatic system as well as terrestrial. Uh, and, you know, learning how something works naturally so that then when something goes wrong, you can understand what has gone wrong. Uh, but we do basic developmental biology, you know, how things go from one cell to an organism. Uh, we do ecological research actually around the world. Um, we do neurobiology. So, you know, we cover quite a bit cell biology. We also have a pretty large uh, microbial diversity uh, group here looking at microbes. And again, that's, you know, one project that I find very interesting and that I've been involved with somewhat is uh, looking at the microbiome in us. And specifically, this group is looking in the mouth. So there's, you know, over 500 species of bacteria that are in our mouth, which, you know, you start licking your teeth and going, oh, that doesn't sound like <laughs> uh, But the reality is, for the most part, we could not exist without them. So they're mm -hmm. uh, being very beneficial to us. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also useful to understand what they are, where they are, uh, how they maintain their um, communities. Mm -hmm. So again, if things start to go wrong, we know what we might be able to do to correct it again. Wow. So it's not limited to marine biology. There's other applications or other, um, I guess, areas of study. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But certainly, you know, we do, I would say, concentrate a bit on marine and freshwater uh, near shore sort of environments. Partners that you work with um, in terms of either universities or, um, you know, in other words, do, do external researchers come to you folks to use your facilities or are there specific grant projects that you're working on or... Uh, actually, yes to all those. Um, so we are an affiliate now of the University of Chicago. So there's quite a bit of uh, collaboration going back and forth between us and the University of Chicago. They also manage Argonne National Lab uh, and Fermi National Lab. So there's actually even internet, inter sorry, interactions with them uh, and the scientists there. Uh, and then I mentioned that we have these 1,500 people come through each season, and those are coming from hundreds of universities and other institutions around the world. So we very regularly have uh, collaborations with those different organizations, and then certainly very locally that, you know, we collaborate with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, George Woodwell Climate 
center uh, USGS National Marine Fisheries and, you know, places like Bridgewater and UMass and stuff like that. And the setting is just stunning. I mean, who wouldn't want to come in person and visit? It's, it's a special um, piece of Massachusetts. It's a special, special little piece of the world, I think. You yeah. have a great view, I bet. I do indeed, <laughs> <laughs> and I enjoy it every day and pinch myself that it's real. I feel very fortunate to have that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Louis, could you um, give our students just a kind of brief, what does your day-to-day -day, like schedule look like when you go in, you know, to your office or your work? And is it a team setting? Like, are you doing, using these equipment and tools individually, or is it um, a team setting at MBL? Uh, for the most part, it's a, when it's somebody sitting at the microscope, so it's mm -hmm. one or two individuals. Mm -hmm. And my principal job in that regard is to train them on how to use that instrument. Okay. And then ongoing as they need assistance, either because they want to do something different or uh, something is not working right, uh, that we sort of work out what needs to happen to correct that. Okay. Uh, so initially, I spend a good deal of time with people, but pretty quickly. Uh, my hope in theirs is that, you know, I can leave and they can just use it on their own and just call me when they need to. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do, again, we offer quite a few courses. So there are times when we'll have a whole course worth of uh, students in the room doing a similar thing, showing them how to use the instrument and what the instrument can actually produce in terms of images. Uh, so that's some part of my day. Uh, obviously, I've got administrative things I need to deal with, emails to deal with, stuff like that, uh, instruments to repair. Um, but right now, I have a big uh, project going on of conceiving renovation of a major portion of this building. So uh, looking at floor plans and figuring out where walls would be and where instruments will be and people and Therefore, the, and, the and then interfacing with the architects to figure out, you know, what they need to do to mm. build that for us. Mm. So, I mean, I, again, that's what I find interesting about my job is it's two days are never alike. Um, yeah. There's always something different happening. That's exciting, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're also uh, just earlier today had a meeting about starting two new educational sort of courses uh, dealing with microscopy, um, also teaching in a University of Chicago undergraduate course uh, every spring. So we're already mm. gearing up for next spring's course, planning a curriculum for that. Wow. And so a lot of education going on all the time, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. And for our students who may be watching this video, um, they range from ninth graders to seniors. Are there opportunities for them to visit MBL or do they, is there a website that they can go to to learn more information or how would they go about um, learning more about MBL if they were interested in? Sure. Uh, well, certainly this is a different time right now during COVID. Yeah. So there's not a lot of visits happening, but they're starting to open up a bit. Uh, MBL does have a website, so it's mbl.edu. Uh, it's gonna actually completely change in about a month um, to a new website. So hopefully cool. it'll be new and exciting. Uh, but on that website, it does describe all the research labs that are here the courses that we offer, uh, job opportunities at the MBL. Um, I have to say there's not a lot of job opportunities for high school students, uh, but once they get, there's probably a few, but once they get to college age, then there are, I mean, we even need groundskeepers and uh, we have a, a cafeteria which serves 300 people a day kind of thing mm -hmm. and housing. So we need help with that as well as, you know, the research and education arenas. Um, there are some high school opportunities, which I'm not real familiar with those, mm -hmm. uh, but I know that they're starting to reach out to the local schools uh, locally here on the Cape uh, to have one week sort of opportunities uh, to come in and actually do some like hands-on research and, and awesome. attend some lectures. 
Uh, and then certainly in a normal year, there's summer lectures every Friday evening uh, and a few others during the week and stuff like that. Great, perfect. Looking back on your education, Lou, and the value that, that it brought, how would you characterize or how do you view the value of STEM education you know, in general? And, um, and then even in, again, helping to build that grow that future workforce sure. even on the Cape. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I certainly feel that STEM is very important no matter what you do. Uh, even if you're gonna go visit your doctor and you're not a scientist, that it's useful to know a little bit about <laughs> biology. Uh, and we, have, we offer uh, a fall semester course for undergraduates called the Semester in Environmental Sciences. And it's interesting because quite a few of those students uh, are not biology majors and some aren't even STEM majors. Uh, but the goal there is that, you know, if they go out to be a lawyer, they might work in advocacy for the environment or something like that. So as much as they can pick up and learn about, you know, the science side of it is useful in their later work. Uh, what I like to tell students from my experience is even though I'm at the biological laboratory, you know, the physics that I learned, the math I learned, the computer science I learned and still need to learn uh, are as valuable to me as the biology that I learned. So, you know, thinking that you can sort of be a biologist and just take biology classes or be a physicist and only take physics courses to me is not a healthy sort of road to go down. You know, you really should try to take some broad classes, including humanities and all those other um, non-science things to be well-rounded because mm -hmm. you never know how much of any of that that you're going to use later on. Because again, the path is usually not straight. It's kind of funny. <laughs> and certainly I run into a lot of people, including in a way you two right now that, you know, write about science Mm -hmm. And so we actually even have a uh, science writers workshop every spring. Uh, and that might be even something to think about mm -hmm. applying for. So it's, you know, a several week program where this, for the most part, the writers who are writing about science or want to write about science and they come in and really sit at a bench and have scientists teach them how to do science and actually do some experiments hands on. Uh, and talk to scientists with the idea that they can sort of learn better about how they work and what they do. And also it's helpful for our scientists to interface with those people because then our scientists see the opposite side of it. How does a science writer sort of think and work and what are their deadlines and stuff like that? So it's a great program that's been going on for about 30 years now. Wow. What awesome. do you like to do when you're not behind a microscope? Uh, I do like to fish and boat. Um, I like to uh, do some yard work. I like woodworking mm -hmm. um, and hanging out with the family. Awesome. <laughs> well, as our last question, Louie, I want to ask what would be some advice you would give to a young student who may be interested in either exploring marine biology or just STEM, the STEM field in general? Uh, well, I, two things. One is I would search out whoever and as many people as you can or opportunities that you can to talk about and hear about uh, these fields. Again, a lot of our lectures now are online. I know the Oceanographic has a lot that are online. Uh, you may not understand it all in detail, but just listening to what people have to say uh, gives you some idea of the possible opportunities that are there. Uh, and then, you know, uh, think about that in terms of picking a school to go to and the classes that you take once you're at that school um, and, and talking to faculty. I think that uh, regularly I hear people say, oh, I don't think I can disturb that person or they won't want to listen to what I want to ask them and stuff like that. But, you know, we're all human and we all like to talk about what we know about. Um, obviously occasionally we just were too busy at that particular moment or something, but that doesn't mean we don't want to do it. Um, 
So don't be shy about reaching out to people. Awesome. Thank you, Louis. Um, I thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us to do the STEM talk. I know it's gonna be a great resource to all of our students um, during STEM week. So thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing from you soon. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me.